Well, hello everyone. Welcome to the talk. Thank you for, for coming to hang by. Uh, this is the last session of the day. So you've been through quite a conference. Uh, we're gonna talk about what other languages can learn from the Beam and particularly a Ruby case study. But first, I think before we talk about that, I wanna take a quick detour to talk a little about uh, Star Wars, Westerns and Akira Kurosawa. Okay, so I wanna make sure my notes pop up. So in 1977, we got a two hour space drama about uh, princess droids and the force. Uh, by the afternoon where uh, Star Wars stream screened, they knew that it was something special. Um, I'm gonna assume you know what Star Wars is. If, I, if you don't, uh, Q and A. Um, it's not hard to see the influence of samurai movies on, from the 1950s and 60s on Star Wars. Uh, its director, George Lucas, was exposed to Akira Kurosawa in film school, and he says that he was hooked after watching Seven Samurai. Um, a big influence on Star Wars was Kurosawa's 1958 film uh, called Hidden Fortress, uh, where we follow two peasants that are trying to escape a war. They wind up helping a general and a princess. Other elements from that story were uh, eventually used in The Phantom Menace. But another genre that's closely tied to the uh, samurai movies is the Western. Um, we even see some movies that are flat out remakes of Kurosawa movies like The Magnificent Seven um, being uh, essentially a remake of The Seven Samurai. We have movies like Yojimbo uh, being remade into A Fistful of Dollars, Dollars with Clint Eastwood. And there's something about these two genres that sort of feed each other, right? Uh, they have a way of feeding each other and there's an underlying sameness that keeps drawing them to each other. I think what's interesting is when it kind of goes the other way. So we have in 2013, Ken Watanabe made a movie, a remake of the American classic Unforgiven by Clint Eastwood. Um, and that was sort of an example of seeing some sameness and then bringing it over to make something completely new. There is one uh, more recent example, which I think is pretty cool. And that's The Mandalorian. So if anyone's been watching The Mandalorian, uh, you can tell right off the bat that it has really, really strong roots in the Western genre. You have characters who are essentially cowboys and gunslingers. They take tropes from, um, at, uh, from all parts of, of the movies and shows. And particularly what was interesting is that there was an episode called uh, Chapter 13, The Jedi, where Dave Filoni, the author and director of the episode, uh, introduces a former Jedi, Ahsoka Tano. She's a warrior trained in the way of the force, all great Star Wars things. Filoni cited Kurosawa as an influence and its cinematographer de described the episode as a magical journey through a Kurosawa-esque samurai culture. I really like this episode because I think it sums up the idea that you can take disparate pieces that have an underlying sameness and watch them build off of each other to become kind of interesting. See, by leaning on, on their influences, we get to experience something that wouldn't exist if we only had Westerns or samurai films. We wind up with a totally new experience and frankly, something kind of awesome. Okay, intro time. That's me in a very, on a very cold day. I'm Steven Nunez. I write code at GitHub on Team Code Spaces. I write Ruby all day, every day, and I love Elixir. Um, anyone who knows me will probably be nodding vigorously now because I'm kind of a fanatic. Um, I write about it, I write it, I enjoy sharing and teaching it, it's really, really cool. Also, as Sophie said, shameless plug, let me see if I can get the, get the shirt going, a little Beam Radio action. Uh, panelists and occasional host of Beam Radio, check it out, like and subscribe, five stars, leave a review, uh, it helps a lot. So let's get into it. So Ruby's an object-oriented language, uh, created by Yukihiro Matsumoto in the mid 90s. It was optimized for programmer happiness and abides by the principle of least surprise. So I taught Ruby for many years and I still believe it's one of the best programming languages to get you started due to its beginner friendly uh, community, plethora of beginner focused blogs and books and a rich ecosystem of gems. So I'll expect the hate mail. It's best known for Rails, a really popular web framework that runs sites like github.com, you might've heard of it, Spotify, I mean, Shopify, not Spotify, Shopify. Um, but there are also other really cool projects that exist in sort of like the Ruby ecosystem. One of them that I really like and want to shout out is Sonic Pi. 
So Sonic Pi lets you make music with Ruby code. And it's really interesting. I was at a Sonic Pi concert and they made some pretty cool music. You should check it out. Um, you can also make 2D games with the Gosu project. And um, it's really easy to read, really fun to learn. So if you're looking to get somebody into programming, check out Gosu. If you look at Elixir, you're gonna see some similarities. I think we're all sort of aware of them. Um, we start out with the syntax similarities, that nice, clean, friendly interface with no semicolons or periods, optional parentheses, no do end blocks. So, so very nice. Again, my opinion, don't at me. But we also see influences in a lot of the testing and tooling that uh, Elixir got from, from Ruby. So Elixir derived this culture of testing from Ruby. Um, Elixir has, a great, has great testing tools and it's because those values are shared by a lot of people in the community. Being a relatively new language, it means it benefits from um, and benefits from seeing things that work. So, for instance, you know the testing we have XUnit, which leans on some of the norms of Minitest and RSpec. We have Bundler for dependencies. We have Mixtool as a result of that, and then we have Mix again, but this time for running tasks. So it's sort of interesting to see that the fact that Elixir came later means that it can benefit from what's existing and what we know works, and actually what we like working with. I hope I don't get hate mail for this. Rails obviously influenced Phoenix, right? Seven controller actions, uh, similar router plug. But this is an example of creating something new inspired by something else. And I say, making it better. So take, take the router, for instance. It's similar in the DSL, in the way you write it. But under the covers, it's all pattern matching. And since it's pattern matching, it's, it's optimized by the beam. And that's, all, that's better, right? Um, in Programming Phoenix, they mentioned that there are consultancies made up of just optimizing your router. It doesn't get faster than pattern matching. So out of the gate, we win. And then there are channels. So channels are an abstraction that sort of fall out of working with the beam. In fact, in Programming Erlang, uh, Joe Armstrong writes, that has a chapter completely dedicated to making the browser a part of your message passing system. Uh, something that until recently, it was completely ignored by the Rails core team. They've recently added Action Cable to support WebSocket connections. And now we're seeing a lot of ideas that were born in Phoenix making their way over to Rails, right? So like I, the, the beauty of sort of like these two communities trying something out, experimenting, and then running with it, and then someone else coming, leveraging the strengths of that platform, and then taking it somewhere further. OK, so back to Ruby. So. Uh, Ruby recently got some new features, what I'd say is directly inspired by uh, Elixir. The first one I want to bring up is pattern matching. You can pattern match in Ruby now. This is a big deal. Um, this is a feature a lot of developers credit for uh, helping them fall in love with Elixir. I'm not going to repeat it here, but check out Kate Travers' amazing talk, Pattern Matching and the Gateway to Loving Elixir. She did a, jo a better job than I could ever do, but it's awesome that this feature a really, really powerful feature that we have on all Beam languages is finally a part of Ruby. And I, I do credit that to that kind of close relationship between Rubyists and Elixirists. Um, another example of pattern matching here, uh, we have, in addition to doing inline pattern matching, we have uh, pattern matching in a case statement. So you use case in, and you can even have guard clauses, which I think is awesome as well. So giving us the option to have this really expressive um, declarative way of writing code is something that we saw worked in Elixir and it got enough attention to make it into Ruby proper. We got some kind of pipelines with the then keyword, right? This is a, as you can imagine, if you've worked with JavaScript too, this kind of concept of let's take some value, let's run it against some computation and then continue to pass on the chain until we get to the end. Um, is a pretty readable line. We'll take a phrase, split it, reverse it, uh, swap the case, join it, and then uh, put the word. So we flip it around and change the case. Uh, very, very like high level production stuff. Not quite as nice as Elixir pipelines. Um, I think maybe you start to do something like this where you break out you know, methods to then pass into the pipe, but still not quite as nice. I think we're starting to get closer with the feature Ruby implemented, which is functional composition which does let you write something that looks kind of like a pipeline. If you squint, this kind of looks like a pipeline. I'll take it. I'll gladly take that as a pipeline. 
Okay. So the next bit I want to talk about is concurrency and parallelism in Ruby. Um, this is the feature that I was actually waiting for. So I think a lot of the syntax stuff is nice. A lot of the, you know, making my, my life easier as a developer, make, making the code match the way I see the world is a really powerful tool, but this is the big one. Um, historically, Ruby's concurrency story hasn't been great. So getting Ruby to run on multiple cores was effectively blocked on versions of Ruby that most people worked on due to something called the GVL. You might've heard of it as a GIL as well. Um, but it prevented more than one native thread to run at a time because it was easier to implement concurrency that way. If you didn't have to worry about things stepping on each other, you, you could you know, uh, build a relatively reliable concurrency model. Um, it did have concurrency printed, uh, print primitives, excuse me, for threads, locks, and cool things like fibers. Um, but I know I speak for a lot of people when I say that the Beams concurrency model was a big draw away from other languages. And it was for me, uh, drawing me away from Ruby. So just a little bit about my, how I kind of got to where I, where I, where I am with Elixir and sort of the amazingness that I see, see as a superpower of the platform, which is the concurrency model and the primitives. Um, we used to disregard how slow Ruby was by throwing more hardware at the problem. So we would say servers are cheap and devs are expensive. So in short, developer happiness towards writing in more performant languages since we can fix it with faster racks. But something started to nag me about this. This assumes that those single core, um, single cores on our servers are gonna just keep getting faster and faster. We were all starting to talk about hitting the power wall, chips would get too hot. Um, and as a result, the performance would degrade, we'd need liquid cooling. It was, it, we're definitely getting to the end of something. Um, plus we started to get multi-core chips. My consumer laptop at the time had at least four cores in it and all my Ruby code was doing absolutely nothing with it. So to quote, to quote Herb Sutter, uh, I felt that the free lunch was over. Uh, but then, then I saw Jose do an episode of Peep Code Meet Elixir. I don't know if anyone else saw that. Um, but to me, it was a revelation. I saw he was doing some amazing stuff in a beautiful language. So firing off concurrent parallel tasks, pulling up HTOP to show he was using all of his computer that his computer would light up and it could heat a room. To me, it was mind blowing that that was possible and not just possible, but approachable. This was me losing my mind. And again, anyone who, who knows me knows that this is sort of the point when I started to organize Elixir groups in like, I would, I would force people to stay after work to hear me talk about Elixir uh, with the promise of, uh, did I promise pizza? I might've promised it, but I definitely never delivered. But you did learn about concurrency. There was, was never great. any pizza. I would like to set the record straight. Thank you. Uh, I owe you a slice. At least, well, you showed up once at least. Um, and I, I fell in love. I felt that this was something that was incredibly approachable, that it was a way of building applications that I could see that also really importantly matched the way I saw the world. So I advocated, I fought for, and eventually wound up building several applications at the Flatiron School um, using pretty much all of the features that I could, I could get working on Elixir distribution, hot code upgrades. Um, very, very excited. So looking back at Ruby and seeing you know, the concurrency story being disappointed with it, I was really excited to find out that they got a new concurrency primitive. So the new concurrency primitive is the Ractor. I'm gonna open this up in a different tab because it's super tiny. So if you can deal with my super slow typing, what I'm doing is I'm iterating over the, I'm getting the count of the processors on my machine. This should be 16 on the right. I could have just typed 16, but I like to make things complicated. We're gonna create a new Ractor and we're gonna do an infinite loop. Uh, and we're just going to, in that infinite loop, just generate a random number. So computationally significant piece of work. And what's awesome is on the right, you can see that we actually lit up those 16 cores. And to me, I was like, okay, there's something here, right? We say that Ruby is a great language to work in. It's really fun to work in. It's nice to get sort of beginner started. What's sort of the gap between what we have now this Raptor primitive and what we would need to make a world-class concurrency-based language to build these applications. So I wanna start out by saying that Raptor.mu is essentially Spawn. This is the code that I ran. Um, and essentially what we're doing is we're making a new Raptor or spawning a new process for every core that we have, right? 
Um, this should be pretty familiar if you're familiar with running spawn in, in Erlang or Elixir. And this is the message passing. So Raptors behave like normal actors. They can receive messages and they can respond to them. So here's an example of squaring in a Raptor, right? And awaiting a response. So Raptors support receiving messages in a mailbox. The values are passed to the constructor and yielded to the block that's here. So I'll pass in the this value and then gets scoped properly or isolated so it can be run in the block. In the main thread, you have access to the current Raptor by calling raptor.current and you are always in a Raptor, right? So if you open up IRB, which is the IEX equivalent, you are always in a Raptor. Cool. So with the basics out of the way, I wanna talk about some of the lessons Ruby can take from Elixir and the Beam uh, now that we have this new programming model. Because if we do it right, we could get some really cool advancements in the, the language and the libraries that we build and the performance and in the conversations we have when talking about Ruby. So lesson number one. One of three. Beam languages have gen servers that give us a way to spin up new processes, figures out how state's going to be managed, handles termination and cleanup. Uh, Elixir offers tasks and agents are super easy to use. So Elixir makes it easy to accidentally do the right thing. With just a few abstractions, Ruby can go a long way to make this pattern a go-to way of building applications. Right now, we just saw that it's, there's just spawn, but I'm going to show you what you can build if we just put a little bit of structure around um, this idea of just spawn. If you want to follow along, check out my github, github.com slash octosteve slash Ruby X, uh, as opposed to X Ruby. I know Sophie complained about, uh, all the libraries being named X something. So I, I switched it up and called it Ruby X. You're welcome. So let's look at some code. Let's make this incredibly big, obnoxiously big. And I want to just show you guys the code that we're going to work on first. If you look at the Pull down the repo, you're going to see an examples directory. And the first one is a, a gen server. We'll look at some of the code that dives in that uh, actually makes this up because there's a counter module and a gen server underlying module that does this. But this looks kind of like Elixir code, right? We have this idea of uh, a counter that we get back, and then we can pass that counter object. In this case, it's a Raptor into counter add a few times and then get the state. So if I do this, I do it right. I'll run it and you should see the number four. Hurrah. But that number four comes from line eight above where we're, we're adding the state. And if we can all math together, start with one, two, three, four, print four. Hurrah. We've mathed successfully. Um, let's take a look at what makes up this code. So the first bit is the counter. And we're calling out to this gen server module that we created. And by the way, I mean me, none of you guys helped, but you're on the journey with me. So we have a start underlying start function, which takes a callback class in this case, the initial state, and then a name that becomes relevant later. We can see that there are a couple of different functions here for async. And in other examples, we'll see the sync option. Um, I did take the chance to not call them cast and call because I don't like those names. I'm, I'm, in, I'm on uh, team Dave Thomas and say that cast and call are not great names. So sync and async, not great either, but different. And then finally we have our callback functions, right? So we can see that this is similar to how the gen server works where we define our public uh, API and then we have our handle calls. Uh, but in this case, we can have just regular Ruby uh, methods. This would be the equivalent of, call, of our init callback. And then this would be the equivalent of uh, one of the either handle cast or call functions. Diving into the gen server, we can see we just spin up a nice infinite loop, receive blocks just like in Elixir um, and Erlang. So we can call Raptor.receive and then just wait for a message. And this process will just block forever and ever until we get a message. Um, this is a little bit of, of fun metaprogramming here where we take the state object that we initialized with the original state. And then we just send it the message that came through. So that's how they match. We take, if you give me, you know, uh, add and then some arguments and just pass that down to the object and it should figure it out. Um, async does the same thing. And then this magical get state function. We also have these top level helpers here, which just get things in the right format for you. So I know what you're thinking. We looked at this example and 
you're telling me that I can get something that kind of marries behavior and state in Ruby. Cool. But that just sounds like OO with extra steps, right? Like we just basically made OO all over again for what? Well, uh, one of the one cool thing that we got is we got fault tolerance, right? I can have this counter blow up on its own and not break my main program. This is also a pretty big deal, right? Something that we have in uh, Erlang and Elixir system is we have just millions of processes running in the background, doing things, maybe interacting with us, maybe um, maybe interacting with our main code, maybe you know being reached out to. Um, maybe sending us messages, but they exist and they can fail on their own. So let's look at a couple of other examples that we get by, sorry, my computer froze, by introducing this new gen server abstraction. So for starters, let's look at O2. There's an O2 example. So we built PubSub. So let's look at what PubSub looks like. Um, again, a lot of this is, is highly functional looking. In the Ruby world, we probably would wrap this in more objects, but I wanted to um, straddle the line of usefulness and readability. So we'll start our new, our new pub sub process, right? Underlying this is being, this is using that gen server module that we have. We're going to get back a reference and we can subscribe to a specific event type. We can see that here we can publish to that event type. So pub sub publish party time. What time is it? Party time. We're going to do this receive with timeout. We're going to see the, the output of that. We're going to see the way unsubscribe. We're going to send more party time. We're not interested. We're going to get a timeout, right? Um, just to kind of run through this. Oop. I'm in a Tmux hole. There we go. Hurrah. I will note that the timeout, receive with timeout is something that does not exist in the Racker implementation, and it was hacked together by me. So if anybody who... Uh, can can make that change official. Th think about it. Uh, right now, receive is just block indefinitely. But here's our event. We're unsubscribing, and then we can uh, we wait for a message that never comes, so it times out after one second. Um, the pub sub implementation is pretty straightforward too, because we have the gen server abstraction. Start the process. Here's our synchronous call. Unsubscribe asynchronously, and also publish asynchronously. And then just sort of the normal way that we would implement uh, subscriptions and, and subscribing and unsubscribing. Uh, a, essentially a tuple with the reference in a Ractor tied to the action. When we publish something, we find the corresponding Ractors that care about that message and then send them a well-formed message or an expected message. So I, 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 I'm seeing a lot of um, benefit from building out a lot of these base patterns. There's a registry in here as well, which I'm gonna skip because what I wanna talk about is, wouldn't it be great since we have these processes that can fail on their own to, I don't know, be able to be restarted on their own. So essentially building the idea of supervision. I mean, we have all of the components here. Can we do it in Ruby? He says leadingly, as he's about to show you that we have a supervisor example. So, um, here we're starting a supervisor and we're passing it a list of child specs. So the child spec takes the name, the module that's gonna start, the function you use to start it, and then also the initial state for it. And with this information, it's enough to sort of start the child. We're gonna see that we start the supervisor, we can get the first child, we can call some functions on it. This just doubles the initial value. So the value at the end of this should be 20. We're gonna get the state. We're gonna force it to crash. Wait five seconds, wait half a second because async programming, and then see that we are back at the original state of this supervised process. Will it work? Maybe. That's a beautiful, this looks like chaos, but let's walk through it. So here we are getting state. We said the value was 20. We're going to crash the process. We did just that by blowing it up. But then we asked the supervisor for a child by that name, or actually by the, the, the first child. And we can see that it reset the state back, All right? So we have now the, the seed of building some, some, form of start, uh, some form of fault tolerance and recovery in Ruby with these, act, with these rackers. So I wanted to show that, what I wanted to show there was that with the right abstractions, you can do a lot. 
with a little, right? Now that we have the idea of gen servers, obviously we'd have to flesh out things like, you know, termination and cleanup and all the other things that, that decades of building gen servers has given us, but we have the ability to do it, which I think is very cool. The next bit that I think Ruby can learn from the beam is working with immutable data. So we take for granted that on the beam, our, be our data being immutable removes a whole class of problems. We don't have to worry about locking data. We don't have to worry about data race conditions. We know that this is data that I can manipulate and I can use to just to, to do whatever I want. And it's not gonna make a copy or anything funky like that. Ruby has very immutable data. So how do we deal with it? Uh, Ruby's take on this is interesting and in that most objects are unshareable by default. Um, so if you send a send mutable data as a message to another process, it will be copied by default. Uh, and that's good because you're free to do what you want with that data, but now you have two copies of the data floating around in your system. So they're decoupled, but now you've duplicated the data. Um, this coupled with the uh, fact that every Raptor creates a new native thread, to me smells like it could lead to some uh, memory issues on a system that's significantly process heavy. You can move uh, data. So here's an example of using the move option in uh, when sending a Raptor a message, create a new Raptor, just let it print out whatever it receives, but we use the move true option. And we can see that even in the, the current Raptor, we can no longer access that object. Even in trying to inspect it, it blows up. It says, you can't send me any messages. Um, this is also a, for good reason. Again, moving data and making sure that you don't have multiple copies is a good thing. But uh, to me, this adds complexity to me as a developer. I come in here and try to send something, a message that was declared and prepared somewhere else. And then I get this error. It just seems like it would lead to some confusion. I confuse easily. There is this uh, make shareable function on the Raptor module. And what this does is it recursively makes everything immutable. It actually freezes the data. This seems like kind of like the, the magic bullet here a little bit, right? Um, so here I have the, I have a hash that is, you know, name my profession and I've wrapped it in the make shareable, uh, the result of make shareable. I can see the object ID is one is 260. I pass it into the Raptor and I print out the object ID. Hooray, it's 260. Everything is immutable. Very exciting. And it does it recursively and that's wonderful. Um, you can also do this with uh, objects and structs. So here I made a struct and then I make my instance, uh, make it shareable, which means make it immutable. And I can see that it did go through every single um, property of this object and freeze it to the point that it now knows to not make a copy. Right? And if I try to do something awful, like push PHP into one of the languages that, I, uh, that are in my languages array, it blows up, rightfully so. Um, the problem with this is that these things have to be opt-in. Right? There needs to be I don't know, some shorthand or uh, best practice on making it so that you are working more and more with immutable data. And then I'll talk about this in my next section, there is an issue with working with existing libraries and kind of like overreaching and making things shareable that maybe you shouldn't. So the things that are shareable are small integers, true, false, nil. Uh, symbols are shareable, frozen strings and regular expressions, classes and modules, and then other raptors. But this list needs to expand. So we need immutable data by default. Uh, again, this coupled with the, the memory issues that I mentioned earlier could lead to some bad situations where we're taking up too much memory if we're not careful, right? We've, we've given ourselves great power, but then also um, not equipped ourselves with the tools to, to yield them well, wield them well. Okay, and finally, I'll wrap with this platform harmony. So on the beam, there's no special cases for when you can call a library or module. If it's a pure function, a gen server, a live view, um, you, a function calls a function call. So Ruby has an issue that I believe will be the reason Rackers don't get more usage. So a large part of the Ruby standard library can't be called outside of the main Raptor. So what does that look like? So I'll open up IRB and I'll just require pri uh, prime, if I can spell, uh, prime.prime. And we'll pass the number two, hurrah. Prime is totally, uh, two is totally prime. Let's put this in a Raptor, pass it into a block. And in this chaos, we'll see the line here that says 
cannot access instance variables of classes modules from non main Raptor. This is a problem because this kind of error is coming from deep within the bowels of Ruby. If you see, it's not even coming from the prime library, it's coming from the singleton library. So, so many things that are connected to these parts of the Ruby standard library are just not Raptor compliant. They're using, uh, they're written in such a way that makes it hard for Raptors to run them at all, right? This is, you can fix this, but this is requiring a ton of work. Um, and there's no, again, there's no way that this can uh, be the way that Ruby Raptors gain adoption if you can't even use the standard library. So there can't be two ways of writing these applications. Uh, just to kind of put a, a button on that, the you can't access global variables, kind of a big thing in Ruby code, right? For constants, you know, system-wide constants, you can't access uh, global variables. So we need to figure something out there. And you can't access, and here's the big old list, class instance variables, class variables. You can't read or write constants referring to unshareable things. Uh, so not great. It's a very wise person said this on Twitter. Maybe we... Uh, Take a moment to read now. Uh, essentially, we're going to have to do a lot of work at, as Rubyists if we want to make Raptors successful. And I think it's worth doing the work. I mean, because like having a, a concurrency system built into Ruby could be a game changer for the language, make it relevant for years to come. Um, it does a good. It does okay. I mean, we run it at GitHub, but I think this is definitely a way of attracting more and more uh, people back to the community. Like I said, we've got lots to learn from the Beam's approach to building concurrent systems. Being the new kid on the actor scene is great because it can learn from others' mistakes and maybe create something totally new and frankly, kind of awesome. Thank you. That's me. Excellent. Thank you so much, Stephen. There's so much to dig into there. And it looks like we actually do have four whole minutes for questions, which is frankly awesome. thrilling. Um, let's pull some up. So there is one with a lot of upvotes. Um, so I feel like I'm forced to start with that. So yeah. what's the Star Wars thing? Explain yourself. Never so heard never heard. So Star Wars, uh, you know, I, what was interesting when I was thinking about this was the idea of using some source material implemented in a new way to create something better than the original. So Lucas using Samurai movies as an influence led to Star Wars, which was bigger than any Samurai movie could have been. But then, uh, you know, the genre sort of like feeding off of each other. So I, the way I saw that is exactly with the channels example or even the router example, where yes, Phoenix is, in, is inspired highly from Rails, right? Seven, action, seven uh, actions in a controller, the router, but it took things that were unique to the Beam platform and made them so much better because it could, right? And then I'm sure there are things that Rails will take from you know, maybe some of the live view stuff and make that better in a way, more expressive, easier to get started, less ceremony, right? Um, so I think it was that. That was the goal of that whole section. Well, first of all, thank you for taking my question, which was totally kind of a mean joke and turning it into like an actually insightful answer. And really what you're talking about is one of the reasons why I personally was so excited about this talk when you submitted this topic. and. You know, I came from the Ruby community. It was the first language that I learned. And I've been sort of stuck in this mindset in recent years where I'm just like, ah, Ruby is, is over. And I think, first of all, that's kind of a BS mindset to adopt regarding any language. Like all of them have their uses. And I, as you do, work with it professionally pretty much every day. So I think that kind of sets the stage for another question that was submitted by some helpful community member. Uh, if Ruby can follow the lessons here, where do you think Raptors are going to take the Ruby community? What's some of the impact that you might foresee? Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of the uh, magic wand or I guess like time machine, um, I think it might simplify a lot of libraries. Like one of the things I love about working in Elixir is, well, I don't need necessarily need like background jobs, right? I can just kind of spin something off, fire off a task and it, it just works. Um, I can fire off async work. Um, it might make it so that a lot of length, a lot of libraries change how they work. Um, you might have something like a rescue that maybe I don't need Redis anymore. Maybe I can just store something on my instance here, use it, fire off a process, work on it, get get a message back, get a response back. I think that might be something interesting. Um, 
obviously the, the performance gains too would be huge, right? If, if we modeled the way that um, Cowboy, for instance, has a receiver process and then spins off another process per request, we might be able to get more performance now. The strategies for performance in Ruby uh, typically are either forking on the OS level or just starting multiple instances of your Rails app. Um, so if we could figure out a way to, to do that, that would also be really cool. Um, but there's a lot to figure out. There's a lot to figure out because you, you can't call active record from a Raptor, then you're, you're in trouble. I think that actually perfectly brings us to another question, uh, which is, do you see any early discussion or efforts toward, you called it platform harmony, which I think is a really nice uh, way to conceptualize of it. Yeah, I mean, no, I don't think people are running for it yet. And I, I think that's a good thing for uh, maybe former Rubyists who have gone to, the, to Elixir, learned a bunch. Um, because as you saw, whenever I would run any Raptor code, it would always say, this is experimental and subject to change. That's great. We want change. Like I want to see change. I want to see uh, the ability to like interrupt the process. I can't. I can't kill a process from outside of a Raptor. Uh, I want built-in native timeouts. Like that's not a thing, right? So having the the things that we've learned sort of on the shoulders of the amazing giants who built the Bean, and taking those things and taking and giving those lessons over to Ruby, I think are really really good. Um, so a lot of people are not looking at it yet because a they don't understand it. Um, which I think is an opportunity for us. Um, and then the, I think they, the summary in their head is it's, I asked somebody who's a uh, Rails core contributor we work with at GitHub. I said, what do you think about Raptors? And they were like, really cool, but it seems like it's gonna be a lot of work. Like that's the feeling, that's the vibe. I like the idea, I like the concept, but oh my God, this is gonna be like months of work to just get something working. Yeah, and I think that really brings me back to the point that you made, which is that it needs to make concurrency and no brainer, right? It needs to make mm -hmm. it easy because that's what Elixir has given us. And certainly that's what the yeah. Beam has given us. And it's going to be hard to convince people to build out some of those pieces of functionality in Ruby with all the extra effort that it would, would entail. But hopefully we'll see that change in the future. All right. So let's see if we have time for one more. Maybe I'll lump these two questions together. Um, does GitHub have any opinions on these things, working with Elixir, <laughs> working with Reactors? Uh, so neither Stephen nor myself are official representatives of GitHub at this conference, but perhaps Stephen right. could speak from you know his own experience. Yeah, the no, no official stance yet. I mean, we are running to we are trying to get on Ruby three. So we uh, GitHub is actually uh, really ambitious about the version of Rails and Ruby that it runs. We run on the alpha build, and then we run um, like the we try to run the latest Ruby at all times. So we'll have access to Raptors in Ruby three. Um, I don't think it's on the roadmap to. Kind of swap over all of our you know background jobs or something to use Raptors just yet. Um, as far as Elixir goes, uh, I think Sophie and I are trying to fight a good fight. That is an Elixir media meetup group that we have uh, that is constantly trying to plan and scheme ways to bring it in. Not, uh, not evil schemes, just no, normal. Schemes. I mean, yeah. I, I think anything you're involved in has like a tinge of evil. Just no. that's just my. Me? That's what an evil person would say. That's what an evil <laughs> person would say. <laughs> 